Okay, um, welcome. I'm gonna do a little presentation here about um, some work on Thymos, um, kind of some texts and readings and a little interpretation of the Iliad. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me, how these uh, thymotic, uh, we can almost say like thymotic psychology um, is depicted in the Iliad. Um, there isn't a book about this explicitly. Um, there's some, this isn't, I mean, there's very few. Um, I'm kind of put, I'm kind of putting a few things together here from Slaughter Dyke's Rage in Time, and <clears throat> which is a book not about the Iliad, but about, <clears throat> but about um, Thymos and psychopolitics. And then we have Nature and Culture in the Iliad by James Redfield, which he's like a classicist. So he does some like interpretations of the Iliad and stuff. I just came across him recently, so I don't, I'm not a big reader of like classicist readings of the Iliad or anything. Um, it's kind of, it's kind of new to me, but I'm getting into it. Um, so in a way, what we're kind of looking at is a little bit of like a Homeric psychology, if we can if we can even conceive of such a thing, I don't think, um, I don't think in Homer's time that when he was writing, I don't think he had an idea of kind of like an individual psychology like we have today, um, like an individual kind of a substantial, you know, self mind, which, um, we could kind of like unify in, in a sense of having an individual psychology. I'm not sure if you could do that, but nonetheless, there's some things about the Iliad which is in in terms of Thymos, which is extremely, um, I think, important to get to grasp. And one of these things is that rage, anger. Remember that the Iliad has been pointed out by Sloterdijk and by a few other writers. Um, the Iliad, I think Zizek in, in his book Violence also points this out. Um, the Iliad starts with of the of the rage of Achilles. Um, I'm paraphrasing, but it's like, of the rage of Achilles, son of Peleus, the man who sent so many to Hades, or something like that. Um, <clears throat> and so this is, an, you know, this is the first text of Western history, and this is a book that's, this is a book that's explicitly about uh, anger, rage, in a way which is so alien to us today, because we, mor we, we moralize and prudishly rationalize and um, try to regulate rage in a kind of way which for you know for homeric um for the time homer was writing in was would have just been obscene he wouldn't you couldn't even imagine it would be a bit like being in like the 60s with all the sexual revolution and then transporting yourself into like a nunnery in like rural ireland in like 1500 it would just be like a different world it would be just like um it would just be impossible to imagine um but anyway, the point is, so we're, we're looking at rage as a kind of divine, it's an emotion, obviously, but it's kind of, it's kind of, a, it's an encounter. Whenever rage is depicted in the Iliad, it's an encounter with a god of some sort. Um, it's also intertwined with fate as well, one's fate. Um, so the, the Iliad is, yeah, the Iliad is a book about two things. What are they actually doing in the Iliad? One is war, right? So, you know, war. Um, well, especially in the in the in the ancient sense of war. Not not drone strikes, but uh or economic sanctions, but uh, you know, intimate physical uh conflict, combat with groups of people with, you know, uh, spears, shields, swords, axes and so on. Chariots as well, of course. Um <clears throat> the, the so there's, there's, there's two there's two actions which the Iliad is constantly an Iliad. One is war, and the other is rhetoric. So, and these aren't accidental. The um, war being the kind of the embodiment of that kind of like thymotic energy of rage. Um, it's not just rage, but kind of rage in its kind of most simple sense, and. Th and the rhetoric, which tries to maneuver 
and shape and direct that energy. So the Iliad is constantly full of the other heroes. Just for people who don't know the basic outline of the story. The very start of it, Achilles has, has a big feud with Agamemnon. And he spends most of the most of the poem by his ships refusing refusing to participate in the Trojan War because Agamemnon, Agamemnon has kind of like insulted him and disrespected him, and he's taken Bresius, who is the Bresius, Bresius, who is the um, Ska, the I don't know, if she's a slave, but she, she's she, well, she is well, she is now, but I don't know, if she was like a royal aristocrat before. Achilles sacked the city and took her basically as kind of like a, a prize. And um, I think he was going to make her make her his wife. So it's very personal. And Agamemnon took her from Achilles. So Achilles is like, basically spends most of the three quarters of the play um, re refusing to participate in the Trojan War. And then as Hector begins beating everyone, basically, like they realize without Achilles and his Myrmidons that they don't really stand a chance against Hector, um, they, all of the heroes increasingly start pleading and using rhetoric to try persuade um, Achilles to participate, which doesn't work until Patroclus, of course, is killed, and then that works. So, but, but rhetoric is an extremely important part of the play because it's, this is constant use of rhetoric to try and maneuver and justify the direction, whether that be the release of, of, of Achilles' rage or whether that be the, the, the restraint of Achilles' rage. So Achilles is trying to justify to the other heroes why he's not participating. He's like, I hate Agamemnon, I'm not, he's an asshole. I'm not participating, he's an idiot, blah, blah, blah. And <clears throat> there's this constant tension between those two. And on, on, on the Trojan side, of course, there is maybe to a less extreme extent, but you have a tension which James uh, Redfield um, points out of Hector as he advances more and more and more towards the, towards the Greeks on the beaches who were attacking other people around them, the elders of the Trojan um, army and some of the advisors he has with him um, begin kind of saying to him, we shouldn't go this far, we should pull back more, we shouldn't go this far, we should buy more and, and Hector kind of gets a little bit like maniacal as he goes further and further towards the beach and there's this, there's this he, he's beginning more, because he feels more and more powerful because Zeus is kind of granting him victory after victory, only then to to um, so that he has his confrontation with Patroclus and he kills Patroclus and then Achilles gets into get into the into the conflict. So you have this kind of divine intervention going on on the level of the gods, who are basically. I mean, this is the point. It's a tragedy. It's a fate. It's it's inscribed into the story. Is inscribed into the into the characters. It's it's their it's their path. They they can't really escape it. So, um, but you also have this. So you have you have the gods. But we're going to go through the, the the god part of it. But you also have the other heroes trying to use rhetoric to manip not manipulate in a bad sense but to direct and maneuver the thymotic energies of in, in particular achilles and also hector um so the first kind of encounter with the gods at the very start of the play um is the scene where basically Achilles is feuding with Agamemnon over him taking away Bresius from him. Um, and he's going to kill Agamemnon. He's like reaching for his sword and Athena intervenes. So this is the restraint part. This is divine intervention on the level of restraint. This, inter this intervention is also isn't like totally like, it's not like this all powerful Christian or like monotheistic God where they control everything. It's kind of like, the gods are themselves using rhetoric. The gods are themselves like speaking directly to Achilles and saying, don't do this and so on. So the quote is, the white-armed goddess Hera sped me as an Athena down. She loves both of you. She cares for you both alike. Stop this fighting now. Don't lay hand to sword. Lash him with threats of the price that, we, uh, that he will face. And I tell you this, and I know it is the truth. One day, glittering gifts will lie before you three times over to pay for all his outrage. Hold back now, obey us both. So, um, <clears throat> this is the kind of like restraint part, but it, again, it's not, like a, it's not like a Christian restraint where they warn against hubris and pride is comes before the fall and so on and so forth. It's, it's, it's almost like, this is not the right time. It's like your anger is justified. 
but this is not the right time. There's a kind of an, almost like an investment. Um, hold back for now because at a certain point in the future, it will it will literally it's like a paid three times over. So, um, but it's it's interesting because you have also the release of rage. So that so so, so the, the start of the play is the restraint of Achillean wrath, and about two thirds of the way in. Um, in the chapter Achilles at the river, or Achilles fights by the river, which is an extremely, like, really, really beautifully written um, chapter. Um, super metal, like, it's so metal. It's just, like, the the kind of grotesque detail they go into of the Achilles rage, which is the point, because the Achilles rage is supposed to be this absolutely divine force of nature. And when eventually, so eventually the... the it goes on and on. They try to persuade Achilles to come back into the Trojan army. Hector, Hector's beating them and beating them back towards the, the beaches, um, towards their ships. It doesn't work. Achilles just keeps refusing. Um, eventually, Patroclus is killed, and this is the release of energies. Pat- Patroclus is killed. The kind of the the, the, the the tragic fate is inscribed, which is already inscribed into the story, commences, it actualizes, and then Achilles... This energy is, is is at the center of that of that kind of divine um, inner direction, and when it's released, this is the kind of force of nature which which comes out of it. So the so the quote is: Achilles went from went for Astero Pois. Like, I'm probably pronouncing this guy's name wrong. It's one of the uh, Trojan, one of the Trojan um, warriors who he who he confronts. <laughs> Um, fresh from the ford, braced to face him there and, bra- and brandishing two spears, and the Xanos, which is a city near Troy, which is based on a river, uh, filled the Trojan's heart with courage. The river, the river seething with all the ewes that Achilles slaughtered, chopped the bits in its tide without a twinge of pity, closing against each other, just about in range. The magnificent runner Achilles opened up. Why are you here? Oh, no, sorry. Who on earth are you? Where do you hail from? you with the gall to go against my onslaught pity the ones whose sons stand up to me in war and um so this this scene basically comes about after achilles basically beats a kind of regiment of the trojan army and then there's like you know like 10 like young trojan soldiers who have survived they haven't killed but they've survived instead of taking the prisoner he just kills them all and throws their body in the river so then the river um, <laughs> the river gets offended at him basically, and the this this guy Astro Powis Astro Powis, his name, um, is the son of a river god, and Astro Powis basically kind of says like, "You can't do this. This is like this is an off- it, like it's not even just that Achilles is a force of nature. He's like an offense against nature. He like exceeds nature. He goes beyond nature." Um. So um, this is so, so. Then basically, Achilles kills this river god. Although the river god does draw blood on Achilles, which is like the only person in all of the uh, Homeric um, mythology who ever actually does that to Achilles, um, other than when he's killed, you know, with the with the arrow through the ankle. Um, but anyway, the point is that th- there's this kind of tension between restraint and then release which is all based around this uh this rage is achillean wrath which it's it's th- it's not through like prayer in which the gods reveal themselves and commune with the heroes it's through rage it's through what should be done about it should it be released should it be restrained should it be directed now here there where should it go this energy is kind of constant we could say and and the, the the communion of the heroes and the gods comes about through a kind of tension in between to like in, a tension of thinking and feeling through where what how, what should happen to it and where it should go um yeah so the the gods speak through human rage they speak through this thymotic component of the mind and um if you don't know the platonic triad of the soul Reason, Eros, Thymos. I have another video on that. I'll put it in the description. Um, Thymos is the part which deals with rage. So um, it's through this part in Homer, uh, which is like on the center of 
divine communion with, you know, gods, the Olympians. Um, so this is really interesting because there's a good quote here from um, James Redfield, which is, um, Achilles' greatness is a greatness of force and negation. He is different from other men in his greater capacity to deny, to refuse, to kill, and to face death. He is a heroic rather than a, rather than a demonic figure because his negations are founded on, not, on the per, not on the perversity of will, but on the clarity of intellect, which is a really interesting thing to say. Um, Achilles' wrath originates and continues because he can see exactly what Agamemnon is and exactly what his proffered gifts really mean, and that's just that's referring to when Agamemnon is trying to get Achilles to participate in the Trojan War when he won't. Um, and he offers him, like, some, you know, back then, what what would be, like, a great gift? Like, I don't know, a few heifers and, like, some gold. And, like, I think he offers him one of his daughters as well to marry. Um, but it doesn't work. Uh, Achilles pursues this, his revenge so grandly and so far beyond even Hector's death because he knows exactly how inadequate revenge must be to the suffering which provokes it. So this is an extremely interesting view of Achilles because I would say that the predominant especially intellectual view of Homeric heroes and characters would be like would be something like this I mean I'm kind of speculating but I would imagine it would be something like this these are kind of like basically this like barbarians just run around the world with outside the law outside order just using force to get what they want when they want and then someone wrote a big play about it because it was kind of like entertaining or it was kind of like romantic or it was kind of like um maybe even cynically we could say something like they were trying to propagandize that behavior or something like that i don't know so uh, but this is art this is not propaganda this is, this is a huge distinction right so this is inter interesting because you, you have to think about why achilles was resisting participation in the trojan war to begin with because he is the central character, he is the best warrior. He is the most. He is kind of has the. He, he's he's the favorite among the gods. He has the, he has the most the most intimate communion with them, um, and it and his wrath is the most explosive, but it's not the kind of wrath where it's just like cheap and vulgar and moves wherever is the most easy and convenient and like, um, we should say like self interested manner, um, so. We could say, like, he was refusing to participate in the war because Agamemnon, as a leader, as an embodiment of who was, like, you know, conducting all the rage of all the heroes towards the Trojans, um, this kind of rage conductor that is Agamemnon was degrading the kind of divine standard of this, uh, <clears throat> the, of, of this thymotic impulse and phenomenology and experience. He was degrading it. Um, he's so stupid, and like Agamemnon would probably just want to do it because, you know, it would make him rich. Maybe it would kind of make him famous in like a cheap sense. Um, where for for Achilles, there's this kind of like, it's just kind of strange, like not morals in the in the modern sense, but there's this kind of like ethical standard to this energy. It has to be directed at something higher than a kind of animalistic. Uh, just desire for self-interest and so on. The um, amount of self-control it takes, just, just to, you can imagine standing at a ship, not participating, being bribed the whole time, also being emotionally manipulated because Hector is beating them all. And he's like, look what happened to your friends. They're all being murdered and slaughtered. And you're betraying your Greek brothers and so on and so forth. The amount of kind of propaganda, we could say, um, the amount of influence which went into getting him to participate failed. It all failed. It only was when his his friend, who was also a great warrior, so he kind of has that warrior respect, that kind of warrior, that kind of warrior ethos that they share, um, which exceeds, you know, fighting just just for a certain king or a certain country or a certain for a certain self interest. It kind of exceeds those more vulgar base um, motivations. When that eventually happens, when Patroclus, when Patroclus eventually dies, which is the tragic component to it, then he's forced into this participation because. What you see through Achilles here is a distinction which emerges in his tension with Agamemnon and in this tension between release and restraint of rage. Um, 
you see a tension, you see a distinction being made between art and propaganda, the use of rhetoric to just manipulate him to participation for the kind of vulgar self-interest of a pretty idiotic and incompetent king um, versus the, uh, you know, fighting for the kind of revenge and respect of his fallen comrade, um, which is inherently tragic and deep and is an example of pathos. And of course, that word pathos, which relates to emotion, um, also has the word path written into it. So there's a kind of direction to it. Um, so you, you have the distinction between art and propaganda, and you also have the distinction between bribery and fate. So this tragic end is is fate, it's, it's, art, it's art, as opposed to the attempts of, um, of Agamemnon to simply bribe Achilles into participation. Um, subscribe if you haven't subscribed before, and I'll see you next time.